Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started with some introductions. Um, and I'm sure we'll have more people populating as we go, but I want to honor everybody's time. I'm Alan Jagalinzer. I'm the professor of financial accounting at the University of Cambridge Judge Business School. Um, I also head the accounting faculty group and am one of the um, professors who teach within our uh, new Cambridge Masters of Accounting program, which is designed to develop uh, change leadership in accounting and accounting related financial fields throughout the world. We have a truly global audience who come to our course and um, a lot of the initiatives are to help move forward the profession um, and change the profession. So including moving to areas that we haven't really fully explored um, enough or where we need new expertise, which would include sustainability and, and reporting around sustainability um, and sustainable finance. And since we're all sort of in COVID and we're still trying to figure out how to manage this, we thought we could do more learning online and host more of these sessions. I'm honored today to um, co-host with Monique Malcolm Hay, who's gonna moderate the talk. Um, she's the founder of New Gen Accountants, which is from their uh, website, committed to providing individuals from underrepresented backgrounds with the knowledge to pursue uh, careers in accountancy. She's an ICAEW chartered accountant and is a senior consultant for Big Four. Um, and she's going to host a session with Dr. Paul Pritchard, who has wide experience in corporate sustainability with a focus on financial services and value chains. He is uh, independent sustainability advisor with Icon Associates. Um, he's on Aviva's external expert climate risk panel He's the vice chairman of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. And among other things, he's also a fellow with the Cambridge Institute for St Sustainability Leadership. Um, I thank them both for offering time and I'd like to hand it over to Monique who will then continue the session with us. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Alan. Um, it's really great to be here today um, on this webinar, which is about an extremely exciting topic um, and very relevant right now, which is sustainable finance. Um, so I guess I'll just start by, um, by giving a sort of a very brief introduction of, of myself and sort of what I do. Um, so, so as you know, my name is Monique Malcolm Hay. Um, I work at PwC. Um, I did start my career working in business recovery services, so working on large liquidations and insolvencies. Um, but I, I recently got a new role where I work specifically on digital um, upskilling initiatives. Um, so that's all about bridging the digital divide between the skills that organizations need and the skills that the, the majority of the working population actually have. Um, so, so that's been really interesting. And then I guess outside of work, as Alan mentioned, um, I co-founded a non-profit organization two years ago. And that's really all about sort of three key things. So the first is sort of speaking with students and, and sort of really trying to change the narrative of what it actually means to be an accountant. Um, because we sort of felt that a lot of people have, have sort of wrong perception of what it actually is. Um, and, and don't really understand how many doors open up when, when you do sort of go into the accountancy profession. Um, the second reason was really around well-being, um, so just sort of providing support to people who are studying and working at the same time. Um, and then the third reason was really, so once people become qualified accountants, really helping them to, to understand what to do next um, and, and what to do with that qualification because there are so many different options. And I guess this webinar really feeds into that quite nicely because, you know, a lot of people um, that I've spoken with in the past week alone um, have said, you know, I'm really interested in sustainable finance, but I don't actually know that much about it. Um, so, so it's really important to have these types of sessions. So, so I think it's fantastic that this is happening. Um, so, so yeah, that's sort of me in a nutshell, um, but really excited to have Paul Pritchard here today um, because he's had some fantastic experience. Um, so we'll definitely get started with the interview. So hi, Paul. Um, hi. Great to be speaking with you today. Um, I guess, first of all, it would be really great if you could just tell us a bit, a bit more about yourself um, and, and sort of your experience and, and how you got to where you are today. 
Sure, I'll, I'll try and make it sound like it was planned rather than as it actually was, but um, thank you. And uh, thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk tonight. I really appreciate it. I just, like you said, um, I think this is a really exciting area in sustainability. It, it's, it's new, it's evolving. It's a time really to get involved if you want to make a, an impact going forward. So um, I'm originally a chemist and I was just thinking uh, before I came uh, online that uh, my tutor a long time ago said, I'm only going to put chemistry on your degree certificate because I actually did chemistry and environment. So it doesn't jeopardize your job opportunities. So uh, I think the situation changed a little bit, thankfully, since then. But certainly, um, there were very few obvious career opportunities, um, other than probably working in a lab or doing academic research around environment. Uh, and that's exactly what I did for a while. I then um, went into uh, environmental consultancy, mainly around uh, contaminated land, water, and from that due diligence, uh, so mainly property transfer, a lot of that coming from the US, um, got various bits of legislation concerned about liabilities. So it was starting to become a bit, bit more formalized and some standards appearing then, this is about 20 years ago. Um, from that, I joined uh, the investment arm of uh, RSA Insurance Group, uh, particularly looking at property transfer. So they had a big property portfolio, buying and selling stuff the whole time. So it's kind of looking at that and also to a degree supporting the sector analysts um, who were starting to get questions about carbon and climate change and things like that. So that was quite interesting. Um, the investment arm got sold. So I moved into the group risk function. Um, again, it, there wasn't really anywhere particularly natural for me to fit in. There wasn't any other environmental role. This is sort of late nineties. Um, so I actually have had the pleasure, I would say pleasure and benefit of operating within the risk function within a, within a PLC. And actually for a number of years, my role was nearly totally focused on risk management, capital management, financial risk, um, capital modeling in that space and, and just a little bit of environment on the side. Um, I actually uh, became group environmental advisor and became a sort of much more conventional corporate sustainability person doing the reporting, carbon reporting, looking at the budget, supporting the, the external organizations, WWF, people, things like that. So it's very much about that. A bit on developing sustainable products and services, which is really interesting. Um, I left um, 2012, I mean, work as an independent since then. As Alan mentioned, doing quite a lot with the Institute for Sustainability Leadership, uh, next door to the judge and uh, also with the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, who are the equivalent, I would say, albeit much younger than the accountancy professional bodies. So it's got about 15,000 um, uh, professionals, uh, professional membership at the moment, um, which from a standing start, probably about mid nineties is, is not bad going. I think it's the world's largest professional body for environmental people or sustainability people so i've been involved in that um for the last two or three years um pretty much exclusively working in the finance space and one of the reasons for that is that there's probably more happened over the last two or three years than happened in the previous 15 or 20. Um, so we've we've seen lots and lots of really interesting developments Quite a lot of them, I think, still under the radar. So the people in the organizations are just getting to grips with a lot of these developments. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily obvious to the outside world where these sorts of activities are going on, which is what I hope to talk about a little bit. But I think one of the people will probably be aware that the, um, the investment community, uh, responsible investments, um, 
been around for quite a long time, but recently become much higher profile, divestment campaigns, all, all that sort of thing. So that's, that's continuing and that's grown. But alongside that, there's also um, a lot of effort going into integrating sustainability into the core processes, in, into the risk functions, into the finance functions. And I think that's probably much less visible um, externally, but it's definitely there. And I'm seeing it and saying I do um, work with Aviva who are you know, really active in this space, but they're not the only one and quite a lot of others are. So um, that's pretty much me uh, saying, I think um, it's, I certainly anticipate um, a lot of interest uh, over and, a, and a, a lot more effort going into this space going forward. And I was just looking um, earlier actually um, around the impact of, of COVID and uh, you know, th there are question marks just like there have been before is, is, is climate change or sustainability going to drop off the radar? And there's been a couple of surveys around it and I would say with some confidence, it's not going to fall off the radar this time. I don't quite know how it's going to feature in recovery plans, but it's definitely there and it's definitely going to grow. And we probably need people like you and the people on the line to take it forward uh, and actually make sure we get a proper transition and uh, covering all the elements of sustainability. Great, no, fantastic. That sounds like you've had um, uh, a sort of real breadth of experience in this area, um, which will be great to sort of um, dive into a bit further. But I think on your last point, um, yeah, I definitely agree. I know I, I sort of recently read an article, um, it was a World um, Economic Forum report, and it was saying that, you know, COVID-19 actually offers a chance to, to sort of reset and reshape the world in a more sustainable way. So I definitely feel as though right now is, is the time for, for everybody to, to really jump on board with this agenda. Yeah. Um, I guess in terms of one of the points that you mentioned, so you said that, you know, some of the things that we sort of can't see um, externally are sort of the fact that sustainability processes are being implemented into sort of risk functions and reporting. Yeah. How far along the journey do you think sort of organizations, you know, are as, as sort of a whole um, in, in sort of doing, doing that? Well, that, to be honest, I think there's a, a really, really significant variation. And um, I think if you look at some of the um, larger organizations, um, they, they put a lot of effort into this and, and they're quite a long way down the line. Um, not not just the finance sector in in the corporate world as well. So there's there's been a lot of effort put into this. Um, unfortunately, um, I think it, it's still a fairly narrow sort of pool of experience. There's I do come across quite a lot, and not always smaller organisations, but typically smaller organisations are looking at the things that are coming through and thinking we've got other priorities or we're going to wait for the regulation or, or um, you know, our clients aren't pushing us on this yet. So there's all those sorts of things. So I think it tends to be um, the organizations with resources that can be a bit more forward looking and um, forward looking both in the risk sense, but also in the um, sustainability sense, you know, this is something we need to look at now for, for various reasons, uh, not, not, just pure risk, it's the opportunity, it's reflecting customer sentiment, things like that. So, um, and um, keeping staff happy. Uh, I mean, I, I really, really wouldn't underestimate how important this, these issues are in terms of staff engagement, that, um, you know, financial services gets a bad press sometimes and diver deservedly sometimes. But I, I, in my experience, just about everyone I meet genuinely wants to do something in this space and wants to work for an organization that's making a positive contribution and it's not seen as the bad guys or, or whatever else. There'll always be people who see finance as the bad guys, but um, not too many, I hope. And, you know, the more, the more that we do collectively in this space, I think uh, people will hopefully see the massive role that finance can play in, in the transition to uh, 
low carbon economy, addressing further issues like ecosystem collapse and things like that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I definitely um, agree with that. So I guess um, my next question to you would be, since you sort of made that shift into sustainable finance, what's one of the biggest sort of challenges or, or hurdles that you sort of come across um, in doing so? Um, it's probably that um, there isn't, and or there certainly wasn't an obvious connection to core business um, in a lot of cases. This is a few years ago. So um, I had an argument, for instance, I used to have an argument every year because our HR function used to pay professional body fees, you know, the, the, for the insurance and the actuaries and the accountants, they would pay their fees, but they wouldn't pay mine. And <laughs> it's because uh, even though I'm a, a chartered environment, you know, IEMA has chartered status, so I was a chartered person and my job was group environmental advisor it wasn't seen as being a profession. So, you know, it's kind of like a hobby or something like that, you know, that I did or, you know, I was, uh, you know, was I a member of Greenpeace or something? Not there's anything wrong with that, but you know, that, that was kind of how I was viewed and um, really frustrating. Um, so I think that was probably the main part. And actually the time working in risk management when um, I think I learned the language much better clearly i was an outsider in many ways I, I didn't come from a finance background but i think that those years working in risks i got to understand how risk works got to understand the language and i felt could fit in and have those dialogues much more effectively and i mean i do see it now my my colleagues who come from a sustainability background it it is difficult to get into finance sector i mean it's got its own jargon it's got its own way of understanding particularly about risk and i think um you know you talk to one of my peers about risk and they'll think about impact on the environment but not necessarily um translating that to financial risk for the organization so um it's absolutely changing so um and i think all the initiatives that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years, a little bit longer, are really helping in that. Um, and the fact that there is uh, a lot of interest coming down from the regulators um, and uh, as, as well as from customers as, as well, and the employees want to do it, I think we're just at that, I wouldn't call it a tipping point, but at a point where it's actually there isn't necessarily the infrastructure there that says, you know, here's your career in sustainable finance. You know, I think the people on this call, if they want to do it, they're going to have to go out and make it themselves, make it happen themselves. I don't think you're going to get many recruitment people coming, or at least not for a while anyway, saying, you know, we've got the sustainable finance position or something like that. I hope there is, but I, I don't think it will be. You're going to have to go out and make this happen yourself, almost certainly. So. Um, it's that sort of change now. I think the situation in five years or 10 years might be quite different. It's might be much more established, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's pushing the learning institutions. You know, a, a lot of the people on the call will have links to, you know, places of learning. It's pushing them within the accountancy courses that they're doing to get this stuff integrated into the agenda. It's, you know, when you're working in, workplace what are you doing about this what's happening in within your organization and like i you know push the hr to recognize the fact it's a proper profession work with the trade association the trade professional bodies things like that so there's all sorts of things that need to happen but i i don't think they're going to happen for you i think you're going to have to make them happen Great, no, fantastic. So yeah, I guess, um, yeah, it's because it's emerging, people have to be very proactive, I guess, in this space. Um, but it, is, it sounds like a great opportunity and a really great time to, to sort of be getting involved as well. Yes. Um, I guess that leads me on to my next question, which is in terms of sort of people who are currently finance professionals, um, so let's say accountants, 
yeah. um, as an example, what sort of value do you feel that they could bring into sort of the sustainability sort of sector and, and sort of sustainable finance in particular? Well, um, I suppose there are several avenues in, into this. And um, I think for probably most people that I've experienced in, in finance, sustainable finance, um, certainly up until a few years ago, were people who decided that they wanted to be a sustainability person and um, kind of left behind whatever they were beforehand and went and, and retrained or took a degree in environment or, or whatever else. So they've kind of gone that way and gone to an environmental consultancy or, so, or something like that. And, I mean, they do get caught. You do see them in corporate positions as well. And I'd never dissuade anybody that feels they want to make that change because the skills that you've learned as an accountant, um, I mean, a lot of this is going to be about data, um, data assurance and disclosure, the sort of, you know, the stuff that you, you guys live by. So I would never say don't, don't shift and go and do that. But I absolutely think that the major benefits are going to come from working within the profession and, and building the extra sustainability skills that you add to your existing skills because in a way um, the accountants, the, the, the finance functions, the risk functions um, rightly have a, a status and a credibility within the sector that um, you know is really important and influential so uh, it Sustainability hasn't really been too strong, I don't think, in, 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 within the various professions up until recently. It's changing now. But actually, the maximum change that you can make, and I, and I think, you know, um, given you know, your, your, your training as well, probably what you enjoy is add on the extra bit of sustainability to what you already know, stay in the functions and get them on board and get them moving. That's That's... I mean, disclosure, um, risk assessment, horizon scanning, uh, all those spaces, scenario analysis, all that stuff that, you know, will feel comfortable to you guys, particularly when you get the, the bit of um, sustainability knowledge that I think will be helpful to kind of give you the background. That That's how I, I would do it. And I think, you know, what, what I certainly do is... Um, look at the sort of areas now that are coming through. So as I said earlier, I think there are a number of areas where, um, yes, in some cases it's visible, but in other cases, maybe not so much, you know, look within your own organization, try and find out what's happening in that space and, and just get involved because almost certainly the people that are doing it don't have any or have very little experience in it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the consultants may have some experience, but it'd be fairly limited. It's really in a learning phase at the minute. And all the um, guidance that's uh, coming out emphasizes the skills gap. There's reckoned to be a huge skills gap. It's supposed to be one of the limiting factors in implementing some of the initiatives that there isn't the skills base within the sector to deliver it. So, you know, it's an opportunity there as well as, you know the the driving the whole agenda forward and getting it really integrated into the system fantastic um and i think yeah that's really important what you said around the the skills gap um in particular and i guess that further highlights that um it, this is really a great time to, to sort of get into this space and and sort of learn as as sort of this space develops in itself um I guess my next question would be, and, and you have already touched on this, is sort of around the fact that, you know, sustainability is quite a broad topic and then and finance is a very broad topic as well. Absolutely. So <laughs> when we sort of talk about the phrase sustainable finance, how many sort of different avenues are there? And You know, I, I, I'm sure there are many, but what are some of the key ones in your opinion um for sort of people to consider right now okay um you're absolutely right and um 
I guess I've been quite fortunate to touch on quite a number of them. Um, and, you know, if, if you kind of take the spectrum, maybe from private equity to, to insurance by um, risk appetite, probably if you, if you classify like that, th there is a huge difference. I think there's, there, um, there are the kind of traditional elements that I call, which are, um the, the kind of due diligence aspect so in in deal advisory um property transactions all that so there's that it that's been around a while and I, i'm guessing a lot of institutions that's that's reasonably well established and you know that's going to carry on and it's an important piece of work um but i think the really interesting area and uh, it, it it is an initiative um is uh the uh task force on climate related financial disclosures tcfd um because i think this one is a real game changer and um it's actually the first really important initiative to, in in my view that's taking sustainability and actually putting it at the core of how financial services operate. So it came out of the G20 and the Financial Stability Board and Mark Carney. So it kind of comes from real core of um, financial services. It's been picked up by the, you know, the, the central banks and the regulators. There's um, a, a, a grouping called the Network for Greening the Financial System who are doing some really good stuff. Um, it's probably not that well known outside the uh, discipline, but they're really kind of setting the agenda for how um, the supervisors and the regulators are going to look at climate change in the first instance, climate risk in the first instance, but I, I suspect that's going to be extended beyond that. How they're looking at how that's going to be integrated into what the supervisors expect to see when they go around and regulate the people. And from that, and um, the, what the, the banks, insurers, investors are going to require from their clients or from their, you know, the, the investees the, the, and the insureds to actually um, understand the risks that sit in their various portfolios. And it's gonna go further than it is at the minute. I think a number of corporates are already reporting against TCFD, which is great. But I look at those reports quite frequently and think, um, well, that's great, but it's a start. And I can't tell the risks that are in your business from reading these disclosures. And, and maybe, you know, I don't claim to have all knowledge and, and, you know, a lot people who are a lot smarter than me be a, might be able to. But I really think that corporates are going to face a much more rigorous challenge uh, about disclosing the actual risks in their business you know all all through their suppliers looking at issues like um, water as well as carbon so it's not just about reporting greenhouse gases although that's important so i think that that to me is the core one and that's the one where i know there's a lot of effort going on and one of the reasons i think it's very interesting is that climate risk is particularly challenging within a conventional risk management framework there's no historical data to go on the time scales can be longer than usual and difficult to quantify and so on so the kind of methodologies that are being developed around this particularly scenario analysis i think are going to be ones that are in demand not just for looking at climate risk but for looking at an uncertain future like we have so you know with the covid experience the these are the sorts of forward looking no historical data you know yes we know it's a risk but we don't know how big it's going to be and when it's going to happen that's that's the sort of skills that i think are going to be more valued going forward in the certainly core to sustainable finance and i think beyond that as well um i'm seeing quite a lot of interest um certainly from the sustainability world and coming into finance at uh, looking at issues be beyond climate so i think climate's definitely the central issue but i think looking at things like how biodiversity and ecosystem collapse 
can influence the finance sector and also the connectedness between issues. I mean, that came up in the World Economic Forum report that all these risks are connected. You have to be able to think that way about connections and understand connections. So, you know, the, the connections between social issues and environmental issues, and you, you can't ignore one without the other. Again, that's come through very strongly uh, with COVID, I think. So, you know, the experience of COVID, I think, will reinforce the need to think about issues like climate change uh, in a smarter way, really, and, and develop these sorts of tools that hopefully you guys will, will apply and <laughs> make it better for all of us. <laughs> Great, fantastic. And no, that sounds um that sounds really exciting. Um and I guess another area as well that um that we I've sort of heard about from from some of our, our new gen accountants members in particular is that um a lot of people have been quite interested in in sort of impact invest investing recently oh, as yes. well. Yeah, and yeah. I know earlier you mentioned um responsible investments. Um, and I, I think I saw um, a statistic in, in one of the reports I read that said 26% of all assets under management in 2016 were in socially responsible investments. Yeah. Um, and this is continuing to grow. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on sort of that aspect of sustainable finance in terms of sort of um, impact investing? Yeah, um, I think... Uh, for a long time, the major developments in sustainable finance came came through the investment uh, world, uh, the investment community, or the investment arm of uh, finance, and it absolutely continues to be at the at the forefront of this. And I think particularly how it connects with with customers. So you know, you think of pension funds and and linking with with uh, their members. And also the, the kind of retail investment products, I think in, in particular, you know, what are my investments doing? A lot of interest in, in divestment as well. Um, what I think um, has happened, uh, like you said, is that uh, there have actually been a whole range of approaches uh, developed. Traditionally, it would probably be exclusion, so we don't invest in this or, or, or whatever else. Um, then I, I guess the, the more like the engagement approach came in. So we'll go and talk to companies and try and encourage them. But the impact investing, again, relatively recently, I think is uh, looking for the upside. And um, it is something, and I, I some mentioned it perhaps because I've got this risk background, that there is actually a really big opportunity around this for businesses to get into the right space yes of course you know there, there are there are there are huge downside risks but there are also upside risks so you know the impact investment community looking for those businesses that offer opportunities so there's definitely going to be whole um uh, areas of development around that and i, I also um in, involved with the uh, some work on uh, developing standards on finance and um, in fact I was on a call today uh, where we're, we're actually having a really um, interesting discussion about the influence how, how do you measure the influence that investors have through their portfolio and and how do you measure it and and it's really challenging so you know and this is one of the area Again, you know, it, it's not my natural space, but it's much more, so what do you measure? What do you report on? Uh, how do you demonstrate that actually, you know, this, this portfolio has improved or it is Paris aligned or something like that? So I think there's going to be um, definitely lots of interest around the data, the data quality, the disclosure space, uh, both by the organisations, the investment companies themselves, but also the people in their investment portfolios. What are they doing? How are you engaging with them? What are they disclosing? So, yeah, it's, um, it, it is a really interesting area. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, so we're almost done with the main part of the interview. I just want to let the audience know that if you do have any questions, 
please feel free to put them in the chat and we will address them in, in the next part of um, the webinar. Um, but just before we get to that, I guess um, my next question to you would be, what advice would you give to someone, so maybe someone who's on this webinar, who sort of says, look, everything you're saying is really interesting to me. I really want to get involved in this. Um, and I, I really want to use my finance skills for a, a wider purpose yeah. um, with sustainability. How, how do I, I make that shift? And I, I know you sort of addressed it earlier and sort of said, you know, people really need to be proactive um, yeah. in, in the space at the moment. But are there any other sort of tips or advice you would give or maybe how they go about that, that sort of proactivity or what sort of training they might need as well? Yeah, um, the, the, the training is, um, I think, trickier than, than people might um, expect. I mean, there, there are courses out there and I think um, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily see um, people taking a year out or to do a master's or, or, or that sort of thing. I mean, you know, it's possible. So I think courses that are particularly focused on, on the needs of finance professionals, accountants, uh, are still relatively few. There, there are a few around. I know the CISL, the organization I'm involved with, um, is, is there. But I, I mean, I know in the, the judge as well, I know is, is quite engaged with building these um, elements in, into the existing courses. So it, it would be um, certainly a bit about, you know, where sustainability being covered when, when you're actually on a course or when you're thinking about going on a course. There are a few um, kind of shorts courses, summer schools, things like that, that are starting to appear probably in the last couple of years. Um, around sustainability and finance. Um, so that's it. Um, I think the, um, the uh, professional bodies, certainly I know the ICAEW, got, got a really good um, hub uh, with lots of information on there. So that, you know, that would definitely be somewhere um, to go. Um, but I, I suppose I would say don't be too disheartened if you kind of look and say there isn't the perfect course there because there probably isn't the perfect course it's still kind of early so part of it will be going out and kind of learning by doing i think in lots of cases but absolutely for sure you know um look within the current courses that you're associated with the ones that you think about going on do, do you cover these components in 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 what you're doing it's you know it's not um it's not something that you cover off in half an hour, um, but uh, likewise, it's not something that you spend full time a year on. You, you know, I would think like, I don't know, I think some of the um, courses are sort of between 30 to 50 to 100 hours, that, that kind of length of time. And I would think after that length of learning, uh, people would have a you know a good understanding to be able to know enough about sustainability uh, to actually apply it within their their sort of main profession principal profession. Great, fantastic. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a really good point to note because I know that a lot of people, you know, when they are making these types of career shifts, particularly with sustainability the sort of default option is thinking, oh gosh, I have to go and do a master's. I have to go back yeah. to university and, and retrain to sort of move, change the direction in that way. But, um, but it's good to know that there's, there's, other, there's other ways and it, yeah. it doesn't have to be that. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't, if somebody wants to go and do a master's, that's great. And um, CISL have a really good master's. <laughs> but um, I, I, I think in, in many ways, um, the kind of conversation that we're having is this is this is something that you know you're leveraging your existing skills you're, you're you know you're understanding it so you can apply your own skills you're not necessarily um, you know going to go out and do forestry management or, or, or whatever else you're actually going to be working probably in the same sorts of functions but doing sustainability stuff 
And actually, I think you're going to have more leverage there than if you kind of ended up, you know, like me or, or, or my peers. So, um, you know, I, I certainly encourage it. Great, fantastic. Oh, I suppose the other thing I would say as well is that um, I'm, I'm sure you've got some people, I think you, you, you know, when we spoke before, you, you kind of mentioned this, that uh, kind of one of the areas that is being talked about a lot and a lot of interest in is around the fintech space. So, I mean, if people are thinking about going up, starting up something themselves or joining a, a small organisation, there's a lot of interest around how sustainability can, can align to fintech. You know, it's more than payment systems. So I think, you know, the whole data issue is really interesting. Blockchain has some really interesting attributes that align to sustainability, um, remote sensing, those sorts of things. So I think there's some really interesting stuff around fintech and sustainability that I don't know enough about, but kind of know enough to think that would be a really interesting area to, to kind of explore and work in. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely agree with that. And, and yeah, definitely when I'm having sort of conversations um, with, with some of my peers, um, there's a lot to talk around fintech. And um, so I think, yeah, that's a really great point to, to mention in, in terms of how fintech and, and sustainability sort of intersect. Um, so, okay, I've seen that we've got a few questions that come in already, um, so it'd be great to, to start looking into some of these. So, the first one says, so forgive me if this is a bit specific, um, over the past couple of months, a number of international bodies have called on the International Financial Reporting Standards, um, so the IFRS Foundation, to establish um, a parallel board to the IASB to create sustainability reporting standards. Are you aware of these calls? What do you think about another body entering this space? And do you think the IFRS Foundation should enter this area? Okay. Um, I'm, it, it really isn't too much my area. So, you know, I can't say too much about IFRS, um, you know, uh, but um, absolutely there are, um, I, I see a lot about creating standards in, in, in this space in general, in, in sustainable finance in general. And that kind of um, maps very closely to, to the accounting standards world. So that there are um, some standards already. There's the SASB, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And there's also an initiative called the Climate Disclosure Standard Board, if I'm, I'm probably, I think that those are what they're called. So there are one or two operators um, in, in this space already, but I think, you know, the ideal is to have the main bodies and, and get this accepted and getting uniform standards uh, across because um, they're, there is an awful lot of uncertainty on things like materiality. So that's a huge issue um, when we look at things. How do you decide what's a material environmental issue or risk? And, um, you know, I, I, we're talking about it today. Now, one of the things that, that came up, we said, well, I'm sure the accountants have got a, a definition of materiality. <laughs> and, you know, maybe we should look at that. And I think getting getting agreement, getting con common standards um, around those sorts of issues um, and really informing the kind of work that's going on in the sustainability world for me it is, is really, really helpful. Um, so I, I'm saying I'm not really aware of that. I know a bit about integrated reporting, which I think is, again, a, an interesting development because in my view, anyway, the next step after climate is going to be looking at how do you, how do you report on natural capital and biodiversity and ecosystems? So, you know, climate is quite difficult, uh, but then you've got the next level of difficulty after that. And, you know, I'll, I'll hand that challenge over to you and your peers <laughs> because I don't know how to solve it. So I think, yeah, th there's definitely space for getting, getting standards um, sorted and, and, common global standards. 
Um, and just on that point as well, what are your views on how sort of companies that maybe are a bit behind in this space, how they can reimagine their business reporting so that it does sort of, you know, really report on, on sort of their sustainability impact? Um, if I'm thinking about financial services, um, I think a, because of the nature of the business, essentially it's a kind of centrally, it needs to be centrally controlled. I mean, you've got to control the ability to make money. So, um, you know, literally. So um, I think regulation is probably more at the core of um, important issues for financial services than it is for some other sectors and getting it into the regulation and to the regulatory framework and the supervisors actions it is probably for a lot of um, financial sector organizations really important that um, some, somebody in private equity said to me you know either the regulator tells us to do it or our clients ask us to do it that's kind of how they thought about it and it's probably a bit extreme um, but I think you know the regulation stuff is, is key to that um, which is a bit unfortunate because I think as you um, implied the, the companies that are starting to think about this not just in terms of there's something bad might happen to us down the line actually there are all these opportunities let's get in there now before everyone else are going to have a massive opportunity around it um so i think uh and again outside of finance it, it's perhaps there's perhaps a little bit more uh in my experience you know what's the upside of this and and you know can we change our business model or to to take advantage of this a little bit more um but um I'm still not seeing a huge amount of that, if, if I'm being fair. So, again, it's going to take people coming in with, with fresh ideas, fresh thinking to actually kind of motivate the, these kind of changes. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I can see how, how that would be the case. Um, so thank you on sharing your views on that. So the, the next question that we have is, so it's an interesting one. So how important is your science background to the work that you do now? Um, and, and should we encourage accountants and finance professionals to pursue science training in particular? Is, is this where my uh, membership of the Royal Society of Chemistry gets uh, removed because I don't tell everyone they should become a chemist or, or something? Um, it, it's been helpful to me personally because my research was actually based, uh, was modeling. So um, the, the numerical stuff that I did as part of my training was very helpful in the fairly specific role that I was doing around capital management and capital modeling. Um, but I absolutely do not think it's essential um, for either an understanding of sustainability issues or, or indeed uh, to work in finance. I think it can sometimes be helpful because you're used to thinking in a certain way and looking at data and data quality, I think, is helpful. But um, it, it's more the approach to it rather than the fact that you need to be a chemist or a physicist or, or, or whatever else. Interestingly, when I was doing capital modelling, um, I, without knowing it, uh, the group of us that were working on it the, turned out to be all chemists and, and physicists for, for some reason. So I don't know how we all ended up there, but I think that's pretty unusual. And, um, you know, no, I don't think you need to go and do a, a, a science degree or, or anything unless you want to. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, no, that's that's really interesting to to hear um, to hear how how useful it has been um, in your journey. Um, okay, so next, so next, we actually have a, a comment um, from somebody in the audience, um, and and what they've said is that they actually work in sustainability consulting, yeah. um, and that there really is a growing need 
in the sustainability consulting practice for accounting and finance skills. Yeah. Um, you know, accountants are no longer found in the back office or supporting management of these companies. Um, so that's just a, a really, really interesting comment that someone shared. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Emma, uh, who made the comment, um, uh, I, I know Emma really is a bit like myself in the sense of having both the consulting and, and the experience within financial service. But is a really good point that um, I certainly see more opportunities in environmental or sustainability consultancies for people who are accountants you know and it's their accountancy skills that are being valued rather than saying you've done a degree in environmental science or something like that good point great fantastic that's really really useful to know um and then the next point is i've just seen <laughs> one coming up and i should have anticipated that <laughs> <laughs> um so we have here can you elaborate a bit more on, on how people can find these roles? Are yeah. there sort of common job boards or, or certain networking conferences um, or, or sort of core firms that are, are sort of really leading in this space that, that sort of people can look to? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it really isn't as developed as uh, in risk management, which I you know, know where you know, there are... Um, recruitment agencies that focus in the, I mean there are recruitment agencies that focus on sustainability and you know I think they they're a useful source of information um, I think it's sufficiently small at the minute that uh, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately however you view it, it it's kind of word of mouth or, or, or knowing people or knowing when the vacancies arrive it kind of comes back to what I said before that you know um, somebody's taken on and you think actually I could probably do it better than them <laughs> you know uh, so I think um, that there, there are uh, a, a, some specialist recruitment agencies um, some some of the MSCs we were talking about the MSCs earlier some of the MSCs that there are connections particularly into the investment world so you know you, you quite often see people coming through um, certain MSCs and ending up in in the investment community, but it otherwise it, it's pretty diverse to be honest. I mean, I I do see people coming from within the organisation being appointed because somebody's expressed an interest or or you know being on a course or something like that. Um, occasionally, get appointed from outside. For a while, it seemed to be popular to appoint people from NGOs. You know, so um, which is fine. Um, you know, so it, it's kind of all. It's a variety. It it it's a bit of a mess, I, I suppose. I'm, I'm I'm probably giving giving that impression. Um, yeah, I, I I'm not aware of anywhere where I'd say you know you will see all the good jobs in 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 this place or or this person will do them. It, it's probably getting to know a few people. It's probably you know, um, hassling people like me and, and uh, a few others to, to let them know and, and whatever else. Great, no, fantastic. And um, that sounds good. So I guess leading sort of directly on to that, off from that, um, you know, how can people get in contact with you if they did want to find out more information? Um, well, I'm, I'm really happy if people want to do LinkedIn and um, uh, so you know that, that that's probably the easiest. Um, uh, I sort of uh, know through Alan at, at the judge again. I think you know that that's a possibility. Um, that that's probably as easy as anything. I mean, just just directly. I, I mean, I actually work as an independent, so you know, just come to me directly uh, if if you've got any interesting stuff. I obviously can't guarantee anything, but really happy to help if if, if I can. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I, I was thinking, um, that there are, um, a sort of, uh, in, in fact, I was thinking actually there are quite a few interesting documents come out in uh, just in the last few weeks and, um, including one from IEMA, uh, that I mentioned earlier, IEMA is a good route into 
sustainability professionals, I would say, contact with them and everything else. So that's that's probably somewhere else. Uh, there's a new CEO at IEMA called Sarah Mukherjee, and I haven't asked her this, <laughs> but I'll say it. <laughs> She'll probably kill me for saying it, but Sarah, I know, is really keen on working across sectors, and uh, she wants to get uh, more diversity into the environment profession. So. I have a look at the IEMA website and, um, you know, contact them or, or, or Sarah, the CEO. I think she'd probably be interested to hear from you guys. Um, don't you can say I say <laughs> I mentioned it, but uh, it probably won't mean that much. But um, so I I'd probably think of uh, as those as a start. But I, I mean, I could put um, if, if it's of interest to anyone, I could put together a, like a, a few documents that would would give sort of contact points and the sorts of things there's actually in the last few weeks um i was just looking earlier like i said and um one of the reasons i'm i'm very positive is that through june there have been about four or five major documents appeared that actually either identifying the way forward so some from the central regulators identifying research priorities and skills gaps which are really interesting um, as I said, IEMA's done a guide to disclosure. And there's one or two other things as well. So um, I can share a list with if people are interested or, or you know, quite happy about yeah. it. That, that would be fantastic. That'd be really useful um, if, you, if you could share a list of, of those resources and contacts and that'd be great. And I've seen that in the chat, um, Alan's popped in the IEMA website link, which yeah. is really useful as well so thank you for that Alan um, so we've just got a couple of minutes left um, so I guess I will try to squeeze in one last question because um, it is a really good one and that is just around compensation um, <laughs> in this space and, and how does that compare to um, sort of a, a traditional accountancy route so we've only got a couple of minutes left but if you could sort of give a, a quick view on that that would be fantastic. Uh, I I would have to be honest and say that um, the uh, the sort of levels of reward in certainly in pure environment, if I put it that way, uh, roles um, certainly isn't as high as as typical roles within financial services. Um, so I was saying the the people that um, you know I've encountered that said you know I've decided to stop being a chartered accountant and and whatever I want to be an environmental person, typically but would be someone who is already financially secure and maybe doesn't well you know obviously going away to study full time and then accepting a lower level of salary. That's um, definitely changing so i think there is a leveling up as as the jobs become more recognized i think within financial services it itself um there is an increasing recognition within job roles and um there's been a change recently with the senior managers regime where there, there's a requirement to formally identify senior people who have the climate change or sustainability responsibilities. So it's actually getting much more formally into job descriptions and recognition. So I think doing it within financial services, um, I should act to enhance your, your career path. But I think if, if realistically, if, if you move out of finance probably, but certainly if you move into a lot of areas of environment probably the, the pay isn't as great um it's probably um more secure than many areas at, at the moment or you know in terms of future outlook and and quite optimistic outlook but it, it probably isn't as well paid um as uh, finance great no perfect thank you for sharing those insights so we have hit time um um, as it is now 8.30, um, but thank you for that insightful um, session. Um, I'm sure everybody on the call um, has learned a lot, as, as have I, um, so it was really, really useful to hear about your experience. Um, and also great to hear as well that people can get in contact with you via LinkedIn um, if, if they, they do wish to know more. 
Um, so, so that is fantastic. But no, thank you for, for sharing your, your insights with us today. Great. Thanks, Monique, and thanks for some really good questions as well. And I'll echo. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you, Monique. And we will have more of these types of sessions from Cambridge soon. Thank you, everyone.